it would be hard to dispute the fact that there is a relationship that is very vital between what I think of God, what I think of myself, what I think of sin, and what I think of salvation. Mm -hmm. And we live at a time when the doctrine of salvation in the American church is close to rubbish. Mm -hmm. I've had the privilege of gathering an incredible library have thousands and thousands of things published in early America. And you read sermons <coughs> preached in the 1700s, and uh, well, what they present as gospel is not the sort of trivia that is presented as gospel in the bulk of churches today. So I'm simply saying there's this linkage my view of God, my view of self, my view of sin, my view of salvation. We need desperately to correct the view of salvation, but we can't. Not at that level, because it's linked with what we think of sin. A, a young man approached me a while back and said to me in a very strange way, at least it struck me as strange. He said, Mr. Roberts, what should I preach next? And I was astonished, and I said to him, I'm not the Holy Spirit, obviously, why are you asking me that? Well, he said, I need some help. So I said, what did you preach last? Well, he said, I just finished a series on the Ten Commandments. And I knew the answer to the question I gave him. What was the response of the people? They, they said to me, who do you think you are to tell us what's right and what's wrong? Mm -hmm. I said, in the light of that, what should you preach next? He said, that's what people hate about you. They ask you a question, you turn around <laughs> and address the question back to them. Well, I said, use your head, that's why God gave it to you. What should you preach next in the light of the response to what you preached last? He said, I'm, I'm at a loss. I don't know what to do. That's why I ask you. Well, I said, if you understand this linkage between the doctrine of God, the doctrine of self, the doctrine of sin, the doctrine of salvation, you know what to do next. We can't tell people effectively that what they're doing is sinning. They smile at us or they curse at us, depending on their attitude, but essentially they pay no attention. They go on doing exactly what they want. And the connection, I'm sure, is obvious to you. If I have a low view of God, I have a high view of myself. And that's where we're at in America. We have people who are so lacking in wisdom that it astonishes us that the stupid asinine laws they pass and actions they undertake. And yet they are credited by multitudes of being intelligent men, graduates of some of our most famous universities, etc. But when my view of God is low, as I've said, my view of self is high. And uh, then my view of sin is all warped and distorted. I find perfectly acceptable conduct that God himself utterly condemns. And no amount of preaching against that kind of conduct is going to have any real impact. You just become as Christians have become in America, the laughing stock of the nation. And therefore, we, when we declare a gospel of salvation that is silly, that is simply surface, that makes, for instance, repentance a single act, or faith a single act, and because a person has a moment of faith, we then declare them to be an eternal Christian, and we give them assurance of everlasting 
salvation. I mean, we're living in the world of nonsense. Mm. And we're presenting as gospel that which our fathers uh, would have, have thought we were utterly out of our minds thinking and proclaiming such things. So, in essence, all I've said is we've got to get back to the doctrine of God that the scriptures make clear. That is the beginning point of the restoration of this nation if we go on teaching a God who is virtually a Santa Claus. We're not going to gain any ground whatsoever. Uh, Lyndon and I have had some lengthy discussions over the last couple of days and that we've traveled together. And, and I said to him, uh, what we've really experienced in America is an inversion of obedience and grace. Historically, obedience was the evidence of salvation. When one began to live in obedience to God and, and did so through the power and the strength and the sanctified work of Christ, they were regarded as a Christian. But now we've inverted those. Grace comes first. Obedience second or not at all in most students' cases is treated simply as irrelevant. In fact, you talk in some circles about obedience to Christ and you're simply labeled as a legalist. And everything you say is simply dismissed as absolutely inconsequential. Uh, these words perhaps uh, will be familiar to all of you. How does Jeremiah 8? How can you say we are wise and the law of the Lord is with us? But behold, the lying pen of the scribes has made it into a lie. The wise men are put to shame. They are dismayed and caught. Behold, they have rejected the word of the Lord. And what kind of wisdom do they have? Therefore, I will give their wives to others, their fields to new owners, because from the least of them to the greatest of them, everyone is greedy for gain. From the prophet even to the priest, everyone practices deceit. And they heal the brokenness of the daughter of my people superficially by saying, all is well, all is well. But there is no peace. Now that describes precisely where we're at. We have announced as Christian millions and millions of people who are as alienated from God as Satan himself. The doctrine of repentance, which I have been invited to speak briefly on, it has no meaning or significance if your doctrine of God is wrong. But when you get straight who God is, and this is the beauty, this is why I love what you've been doing, brother, uh, in terms of uh, the fathers in Washington, uh, you know, I think we can honestly say some of the men who were least Christian in the early days of America were more Christian than most of our pastors in America today. They had a higher view of God, a greater sense of their need of Christ and of their total dependence upon Him. So the first and the foremost task of the church, I am convinced, is to return to the doctrine of God that the scriptures are crystal clear on. When that doctrine is restored, then you can preach the law of God with effectiveness. People will feel the weight of their sin, the guilt, the grievous damage that they have done to God himself and to themselves, and then they will be ready to listen to the message of repentance and faith. But you leave out 
a correct view of God, and you really don't get anywhere at all on this issue. Now, what we're faced with is not merely this amazingly absurd notion about God as a Santa Claus type and this uh, inversion, as I've said, of grace and obedience. Uh, but we're being taught that a person is a Christian if they pray a prayer, if they have a moment of faith. Now, I know some of the men who've been at the forefront of this movement, and I respect them as individuals, but I don't have any hesitation about declaring their heretics. Christianity is not a matter of a sinner's prayer. One becomes a Christian when they realize God created them for himself. And they have lived not for God, but for themselves. <clears throat> and they have come to that point where they realize, I must repent. I must cease to put myself in the position up front. The God who created me deserves my utter surrender of myself and my casting all of my sin upon the Savior and living a life of repentance and faith. And so their life is therefore transformed because repentance and faith have truly taken place in their life. Now that is not present in the church in most instances. And I doubt personally that more than 30% of those who call themselves Christians in America are anywhere near Christian. And so I believe deeply that we have brought upon ourselves this awful mess that we're living in as a nation that has departed from the Lord. And it's not until the church turns back uh, that uh, we have any hope of the nation. I personally was deeply grieved and upset at the great amount of focus prior to the last election uh, upon getting the right candidate. Uh, I was relieved when Obama won. He would have been the last man in the world I would have personally voted for. But anybody else would have been no better because the, politi the politicians are not our problem. Our problem is our relationship with God as a church. Uh, I've said on many occasions, I wrote a little booklet that's been uh, fairly widely distributed uh, on uh, the, the title, Inalienable rights, and based on the government statements, obviously. But, uh, uh, but, but I don't find many people who have ever faced this reality. Those rights that we said are ours as a result of uh, uh, God endowing them upon us are only ours as we preserve his rights. When we violate his rights, we guarantee the loss of our rights. And I believe one could look at the Ten Commandments and say, the Ten Commandments, in a certain sense, are God's declaration of his rights. He has the right to say how his name is to be used. He has the right to say how one day out of seven is to be cared for. He has the right to say whose property belongs to who. As the creator of sex, he has the right to say how sex is to be utilized and what is an abomination in his sight. But the church does not believe sufficiently 
in God's rights, to grant them to him, to teach them to the people as God's rights. Instead, the bulk of the people are left to think that these rights are theirs. Among those things that I personally am deeply grateful for in my own personal library are a large number of pamphlets that were published in this country in the 1600s and in the 1700s that go under the general title of Fast Day Sermons or Election Day Sermons. There's a vast array of them, uh, and uh, while most of them are hard to find now in the actual printed form, all of this stuff is now available to anybody on the internet. But when one goes over these early fast day sermons of election day fast, sermons. Fast like an F-A-S-T. F-A-S-T, fast day. They're literally, they were sermons preached at solemn assemblies mm -hmm. because continually national government, state government, and religious leaders were calling the nation to fasting and prayer. If, for instance, a, 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 a great earthquake occurred in the city of Boston, immediately a solemn assembly was called. If, uh, say, three young men drowned in the Charles River, uh, that was taken uh, as a possible sign from God. And so a fast day was called to inquire of the Lord, what are you saying to us in these calamities that are taking place? But in these fast day sermons, almost all of them, it seems, begin with calling people back to hearkening carefully to the Ten Commandments. Mm -hmm. And the list of sins that is given <coughs> begins essentially with violations of the Lord's name and violations of the Lord's name. So what I'm trying to say is we are not in a situation where preaching on repentance is effective. Mm -hmm. Not that it shouldn't be preached on preaching on repentance constantly. And I'm living in amazement. Uh, I've been preaching for 67 years, and I'm astonished every time I get an invitation uh, to preach again. I, uh, <laughs> you know, many times in my life I thought, well, I'm finished now. And the, the Lord has no further use for me. Now another invitation comes out of the blue. And there I am again uh, with another opportunity that I preach and I preach. So you repent preach. of your retirement. Uh, well, I never <laughs> intended to retire. It's just that it looks as if maybe uh, it, it's going to happen. But anyway, uh, I don't give up preaching on repentance because people aren't paying much attention. But nonetheless, underneath it, I am well aware that until the doctrine of God is properly restored, there will not be any true effect. So if I may summarize the little that I've tried to say is, I believe that the time is upon us when we must take the initiative and to set our hearts to bring the nation back to an understanding of the God of the Bible. That which made us great was this understanding that God created us for himself, not for ourselves. And that uh, as we live in the light of that, then we will live repentantly. Now take the few moments we spend on the subject of prayer. Or why is there a prayerlessness? Or why in the little bit of praying that is going on is it focused upon temporal things? And there's virtually no kingdom praying taking place and uh, no real uh, ministry of intercession taking place in the typical situation. Well, that's so because our view of God is so low that uh, we, we don't really have any expectation that God, God is going to intervene 
and do something absolutely <clears throat> magnificent. So there's a sense in which the bulk of the praying that takes place, especially corporately, is what might be described as safe prayer. You know, you don't r run any risk when you ask God to heal Billy Joe of his broken wrist. God created the body to heal. But most of the praying that goes on is of such a nature that nobody is running any risk whatsoever in asking God for it. But when we ask God for revival, despite the stupid men who think revival is something they can create, fortunately they are in the minority, and in every instance they're proven erroneous, so they don't pose much of a threat. But you ask God for revival, and this is what you come up against. You don't pray for revival very long before God says to you, don't waste your time. If you want revival, you're going to have to deal with this and this and this and this in your own life. No serious praying for revival exists for any length of time until the spirit of brokenness comes mm. or such resistance that people simply discontinue praying for revival. But you're not going to pray for revival until you have a sense of a God so great that in a moment of time you can literally turn the whole thing around. I think one of the most critical words in all the vocabulary of revival is the word suddenly. Mm. And everything looks absolutely beyond hope, like it does now mm. in our own country. And then suddenly God is there and everything is radically turned around. Mm. Mm -hmm. So, it, again, when the doctrine of God is right, then I'll be overwhelmed with humility, with shame. With grief. Jesus laid this out in the Beatitudes in a truly powerful fashion. Blessed are the poor in spirit. And if you think about it, if you ask this question, in how many realms is it possible for a human being to relate? Well, as near as I can discover, three. We can relate upwardly with God. We can relate inwardly with ourselves. We can relate outwardly with others. The first three Beatitudes, blessed are the poor in spirit, the upward relationship, when before God I have lost all pride. When I know, I mean, if I may just personalize this, 81 years of age and raised in the church, exposed to some of the greatest Christians in history, sat under some of the finest preachers the world has ever known, had a relatively decent education, have, as I said already, a magnificent library. By this time, I ought to be a giant. Instead, you're looking of a silly little guy in knee pants, scarcely, scarcely having made any spiritual growth at all in all these years. I mean, all of us have this overwhelming awareness of how far short we have fallen. So poverty of spirit. And when one begins a day, with this deep sense of personal poverty of spirit. And then eventually you've got to stand in front of the mirror to do whatever's necessary by way of fixing your hair so it doesn't look the worst possible. <laughs> and uh, maybe seeing that your necktie is tied and not on straight. Uh, you, you look in the mirror, how, how do you feel when you look in the mirror? It, it, is it not inevitable if we began the day by being overwhelmed with our lack of godliness, that when we look in the mirror, we're going to mourn. Mm -hmm. 
We're going to feel deeply our failure. We're going to remember the grievous and the stupid things we said and did yesterday and that we're in danger of saying and doing today. So inwardly, we accept the fact that what we admitted to God, that he's everything and we're nothing, we're admitting it to ourselves. The hang-up, I think, for the bulk of the church is in the third beatitude. Blessed are the meek. Over and over, I'm with men who admit to God he's everything and they're nothing. They admit to themselves what reprobates they really are. Then they stand in front of their world and pretend to be saints that they never came anywhere near. Mm. But those three things, I mean, the beauty, this passage is so powerful. When you put those three things together, a person who is trained in terms of the relationship with God, who's empty in terms of himself, who has admitted their emptiness to the world, you've got nothing left but hunger and thirst. And the blessed promise, those that hunger and thirst for righteousness shall be filled. And what we're living with is a church who has never hungered and never thirsted for righteousness, therefore knows nothing of fullness, therefore knows nothing of true repentance, nothing of true holiness, nothing of true prayer. And so the answer again, come back to that point where God becomes all in all, and then repentance uh, will inevitably follow when the law of God slaves us, when we are mowed down by our awareness of sin, and then exercise repentance and true faith, and then live in it the rest of our day. Amen.